Hi guys, so I'm going to try to do this in one take and not have any edits as promised. I'm just going to read you my notes. Today was the opening of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial here in New York City at the U.S. Southern District Court, which is a federal court in downtown New York City. And first of all, I want to thank God and praise him for allowing me to be uh, a part of this to allow me to see this so that I can report back to you guys because if we don't get it from the regular media then it's up to us I think to go out there and see what's going on and if any news is breaking in your town I would recommend you do it as well that way we can actually get some boots on the ground news and and a trusted source right um so I hope you guys trust me I'm doing my best to to um to stay true to the trust you've already given me. And so that's why I went today. And I also wanna thank my family and my friends and all of you so much for your prayers and for your support. It meant the world to me. I mean, once I got in there, I was so uh, just amazingly, I, I don't know, relieved, I guess. The relieved was part of it, but also like excited. Like I couldn't sleep last night at all thinking about today. And I got there at around 8.20 in the morning and there was already a line. Now, I want you to know that this was kind of like a leap of faith because yesterday, all over Twitter, there were so many tweets saying that the judge had decided that there weren't going to be any spectators, there wasn't going to be any media, and so I got sent all of these tweets, and some of them were from people that I actually follow, like Jack Prosaic, and I'm not saying anything against him, anybody can get it wrong, I'm just saying they were trusted sources, and I was like, you know what? I don't care what Twitter says, I'm going to go anyway. And I'm glad that I did because the line was long, but there was a line. And as soon as I got there, uh, I met two journalists from Vanity Fair who were super nice. And I asked them what's going on, you know, are they going to let us in? He said, yeah, it's not a problem. And exactly right. However, it was very cold this morning and thank God I wore like a ton of layers, but it was like Okay, so I got there at 820. We didn't go inside the building for like an hour and 45 minutes and it was freezing at that point. Like I couldn't even text anymore. My thumbs were frozen. And so we finally got inside the building and once we got inside the building, it was even longer. By the time we got into holding, it was almost two o'clock. So do the math. It was a long day, but at least we were inside. Um, I just want to say also that all of the um, security at, at the courthouse were super nice. Um, they kept us up to date. They told us, you know, you guys have time if you want to go to the cafeteria, which thank God, because I, I left my house with just coffee. And so we were able to do that. They were super nice. Apparently what had happened, because we're in the lobby, we're waiting to go into holding, and they told us that they had three rooms for holding for for media, there was another uh, room, but they also would put them in holding with the rest of us. Um, so they had the space, but at like 12, they still hadn't picked the jury. Apparently they had a problem with one of the jurors and we weren't told what the problem was or what happened, but we were only told that they were picking the last juror and, and, and you know, they kept coming back to us like, oh, it'll be like another 20 minutes, guys, another 20 minutes, like in like, an hour and a half went by like that. So we never were told. So I don't know what happened with that juror. I don't, we weren't told that. Um, and I can't imagine there's any way for us to know. But uh, they picked the juror like minutes before starting the trial, which I thought was super bizarre. Like I've never heard of a trial of this magnitude having like this last minute type of deal. Like, I, I don't know. I just, the whole thing sounded weird to me. Maybe I'm biased. I don't know, but it just sounded off and I wasn't alone. So we finally get inside the holding. Holding was in our room, which was room 110. There were 27 people. I'm pretty sure it's 27, but I'll, I'll check out my notes. I have my notes right here. So I'm going to be reading off of these. Uh, there were 27 people and we were spaced. So it was like social distancing and all that. We had to wear masks, of course. And, um, and then in front of every seat, there was a 23 inch television, which was like a live feed into where the actual trial was taking place. So we sat there for 
a little while with nothing going on. And then finally the courtroom where the trial was actually taking place started, you know, they started coming in. I kid you not, like I did not even recognize Ghislaine Maxwell. Like I was thinking of somebody else because of the reports from the media, like, oh, her hair's gone gray and it's long and whatever. No, I noticed it was her because like eventually I was like, oh, this has to be her. But she looked completely relaxed. Um, she was wearing a beige top and black pants. Her hair's like down to here and it's brown. It looked nice. She looked like if you didn't know what was going on, you wouldn't think anything of it. Like she just looked super relaxed and normal. And then there was a gentleman next to her, I assume her lawyer, and there was a woman next to him, uh, like toward the aisle, right? So she's sitting all the way toward the wall and toward the aisle is this um, woman. Now, on the prosecutor side, there were three really young women. So I'm like, mm, okay, where, where's the prosecutor? Like, what's going on? Okay, so just to let you guys know, the opening statements were made by for the prosecutor, for the prosecution. Uh, it was Assistant U.S. Attorney Laura Elizabeth Pomerantz. Okay, she, very young woman, very young. And for the defense, it was uh, Defense Attorney Bobby Sternheim. And, you know, both ladies were very prof uh, professional and everything. Okay, so finally, um, let me, let me just get into the notes now because I don't want to say anything. So in before the judge came in, before the jury or anything else, right? So there was a time where there was, I, I guess it's the clerk. So the, the blonde woman who I, I assume is the clerk. And um, so Glaine writes a note and like goes like this and the clerk comes over and takes the note, right? And then... Um, so she's just like drinking coffee, whatever she puts on her glasses. She's very normal. And so then the clerk comes back and says something to Ghislaine, I guess about the note. We can't hear it at this point, right? But Ghislaine goes like, like this, like she's happy, like this was good news, I don't know. And then, um, so it was like a thank you, right? And so then, um, okay, so she was just like, Okay, so then the clerk comes back after a minute and she and Ghislaine are talking and they're like like this, right? So they're like leaning into each other. And I don't know what Ghislaine is saying, but she touches her heart like this. And then the clerk grabs Ghislaine's arm, her forearm like this, like to reassure her, like, you know, like this. And she's like going like this. And I don't know what was the deal there, but my job, I felt was like to notice everything that she does and what the interactions are between her and whoever else is in that room. Um, because I don't think that the news is gonna tell you that and I think it's important. All right, so then, uh, thank you guys for being patient. Okay, so, so yeah, like I don't know what they talked about, but here I wrote like it, it seemed like they had an understanding, some type of un understanding or like some type of uh, agreement, whatever. So then she unhooks her mask and, you know, she was writing, uh, Ghislaine was writing. And then when the judge walked in, she put her mask back on, everybody stood up, right? So now I'm realizing like, oh, that is the prosecutor right now for the opening statements. And my impression was she looks like a very, very young woman, like a woman who's still in college. I'm not trying to offend her in any way. She just looked very, very young, right? And so then the jury started coming in. Now, mind you, the way that the camera was angled in that room, we couldn't see the jury coming in, but at the bottom of the screen, of the TV screen, you could see their heads coming in. What I counted was eight men and four women, okay? So that's what I could tell. And they were like coming, um, they were passing uh, by the bottom of the screen of the TV. And that's how I was able to like count, right? So opening statement. So again, opening statement is by, was by um, Assistant U.S. Attorney Laura Elizabeth Pomerantz, right? So Pomerantz um, starts off very clear, very uh, powerful, 
right? And she starts off by saying like, I want to tell you a story about a girl named Jane. And that's how it started. And then obviously Jane is not the name of the victim. I don't think they're all using aliases, which by this point, I don't see why, but whatever. And so she tells us a story about 1994 and um, how... Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein met this young girl. She was only 14 at the time and how they targeted her. And she called them, quote, predators, right? And then she said they tar targeted children for abuse. Um, who was that? It was the defendant, Ghislaine Maxwell. And she pointed right at her, right? And she said, quote, she knew what would happen to these girls. Uh, she uh, made it normal and casual, uh, sexually exploited young girls. Um, she served them up to be sexually abused, and she accused Ghislaine Maxwell of trafficking, right? Then she explained that everything in the trial, was, which is scheduled for six weeks, uh, there were going to be two parts. One part was the evidence presented, and the second part, how it's going to prove that Ghislaine Maxwell is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now she's being charged with six counts, right? Two of them, one for attempting to, and another one for actually transporting a minor across state lines for um, criminal sexual activity. And the other one is um, engaging in sexual activity with a minor and also proposing or um, uh, uh, to get a minor to engage in this. So it's two counts for each of that and then two for perjury, right? So. As this woman's talking, as Pomerantz is talking, uh, Ghislaine turns her gaze toward the jury. But when, when Pomerantz mentions the house in Paris and Little St. James, um, she kind of like looked away, like the jury was here and she kind of like looked away and just like stared off blankly, right? And then, uh, okay, so Pomerantz called her, quote, the second in command. Quote, she was the lady of the house. This I know to be absolutely true. People have said this, right? In, in other uh, publications of Vanity Fair, um, I believe I, I said it in my other video, there was a whole spread about Epstein back in the day before all this started and Epstein called her his best friend, um, that she's like the closest person to him. All the staff was like, she's the lady of the house. She's a very aggressive assistant. So none of this was new. It wasn't like Pomerantz was making this up. Other people have already said this. So she was just reiterating that. Okay. Thank you. So Pomerantz says that Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein created a quote, culture of silence in that house for the staff, right? And it was to set up, to make sure that nobody in that house ever spoke about anything that they saw or heard or whatever. This is what Pomerantz is saying. So then uh, Pomerantz started repeating herself a lot. Now, I assume that this is some type of tactic to help the jury keep in mind what matters. She kept talking about the massages, right? She kept saying that these, these girls, there were girls, there were teenagers at the time of, of whatever happened, the alleged abuse, and that none of them was a professional masseuse, and that these massages and how um, Glenn was finding girls and bringing them back for these massages. And that um, as she was talking about these massages, Glenn started taking a lot of notes and then she'd lay it down for her lawyer to read, right? And then he would read it and then he'd write something back and they kept going back and forth this way. Okay. She, okay, okay, when... The, when she continued, when Pomerantz continued with Jane's story, because she, she kind of like started with Jane's story and then kind of went off into like what was going to be spoken about in the trial. When she continued with Jane's sto story, Glenn looked forward. She just looked forward, like the jury's over here. She just looked forward and kind of like, like just very, like a block of ice, like nothing, no emotion, right? So the clerk, again, the blonde clerk from before the the uh, judge had come in, reached over and gave her a note to Glenn Maxwell and to her and to her lawyer and all three of them read it. Glenn, the gentleman, and um, Steinhem. I don't want to mispronounce her name, but the three of them read the note and then 
The prosecution, like I said, became repetitive, kept saying over and over about the massages, the massages, the massages, and the, the clerk and just kept, there were a lot of notes going back and forth between the clerks. Now, Pomeran said that she was going to be bringing witnesses and amongst the witnesses are victims, pilots that were involved in whatever flights, employees of the house, the staff of the house, and law enforcement witnesses from 2005 and 2019. She was going to be, she's going to be producing flight logs with the names of the victims on it um, and a Federal Express receipt when Epstein sent a gift to a 15 year old girl and just some other uh, information that would help tie this all together that yes, they were actually at the same place at the same time as, as um, Jane. And so just to set up the timing, yes, this did happen, right? Okay, here we go. So the defense comes up and fine. Like I expect her to, to obviously defend her client, right? Because a lot of people feel like, well, you know, there's not really any proof and whatever. That's fine. I, I understand that whole concept. However, the defense comes up and she started off by saying that ever since Adam and Eve, women have been blamed for the actions of men. When she said that, there was like an audible gasp in our room. Like, I think everybody there was kind of like, what is she saying? Like, this is not the way to go. So she doubled down on it, right? Her message is, women are often villainized and punished more than men. That's one of the arguments. Ghislaine Maxwell is getting blamed for Epstein's actions and the other powerful men involved. So basically it's, she's setting, the defense is setting up Ghislaine Maxwell as the victim here, you know, oh, she's a poor woman. And once again, women are being villainized for the actions of powerful men. And, you know, this can't go, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing her, but we all know <laughs> that Epstein was a horrific, I mean, he may have had good attributes. I, I can't imagine what they were, but what he did like, and, and for so long and the men that were in that whole thing, I mean, so now it gets, it gets crazier, right? So she says, well, Epstein's, um, Glenn, Glenn is getting blamed for Epstein's actions and she isn't him. Uh, women get blamed, women get blamed for the sins of men. That's a direct quote. Then she said, you are here to determine whether the government can prove that Glenn Maxwell has committed these crimes. Now, this is interesting because when the defense was speaking, never did she address the prosecution as the prosecution. She consistently called the prosecution the government. That was, so there's a lot of wordplay going on here, right? And for, I guess, people maybe that aren't very aware of how words can affect the way that you um, understand something, I think the repetition of the word the government considering like the political landscape of our nation right now, it, uh, clearly it's a manipu manipulative tactic to get, I don't know if certain jurors there maybe don't want government or don't like our government to try to like equate the prosecution with the government, even though obviously it is, but it's, it was just very bizarre. I've never seen a trial or heard a trial where the defense is saying like, not saying the prosecution, it's saying like the government, the government, it wants you to do this. The government wants you to do that. So I don't even know, like in a way it kind of sounded like they were trying to, anybody who's like anti, this is the feeling I got, okay? Like if you are, let's say a person in New York City, there's a lot of us that are anti, mandate and pro-freedom, right? Even though you wouldn't know that, but there's a lot of us, right? And it almost sounded as if the defense was playing to that, understanding that that exists here in the city and playing to that emotion. Like, oh, you see, it's the government once again, trying to um, encroach on our freedoms, encroach on our rights. And you guys aren't for that, right? You guys are totally against that. And see, here's another example of that happening. That's how I, started taking it because I, I don't know how many times I should have counted. I don't know how many times she said 
it was like a drinking game. Like the prosecution was the word massage. I don't know how many times Pomeran said that. And the defense was the government. Like it was just like bang, bang, banging away, right? And then, so the defense, I want to get her name right. I'm sorry, guys. I want to, okay, yes. Defense attorney Bobby Sternheim, right? So she said, this is a direct quote. I stand before you proud to represent Ghislaine Maxwell. Okay, like that's unnecessary. Like, why would you be proud of that? That's fine. Um, okay, another direct quote. There are four accusers, not the hundreds that the government claimed. I did not understand what, sorry about the beeping, this is New York. Um, I did not understand what difference that made. That's like saying, well, they only murdered one person, not thousands. Like, what does that matter? Even if it's one person that got trafficked, isn't that still a crime? And if you're involved in that crime in any way, shape or form, especially when kids are involved, isn't that still something that should be taken seriously? This is a serious offense that she's being accused of. Excuse me. So saying that it's four accusers, not the hundreds that the government claimed, I didn't understand like, what was the point of saying that? She said that their memories are corrupted because it's been 15 to 25 years. Uh, four accusers, again, she kept saying that memories fade over time. Events happened 15 to 25 years ago. Then she pivoted hard. She stopped talking about the accusers. She, first of all, she never talked about Ghislaine that I heard. She didn't talk about her at all. She talked about the government. She spoke about women. She spoke about the government. She spoke about the accusers. And then she spoke a lot about Jeffrey Epstein. And this is when it got really, really weird, right? So she starts saying, well, Jeffrey Epstein manipulated, um, you know, but at this point, well, when she said this next thing, the prosecution, the, pros the prosecution, it was a team of three women. They all looked at each other like, like, I'm sorry, what? And we all were like that. All of us in that room were like looking at each other like, did I just hear that right? It's right. So, um, okay, she called. I'm going to tell you what made us all go crazy, but I didn't write it down um, perfectly because this looks like a mess because it was. All right, so then... She said that Glenn Maxwell is a scapegoat. That was overruled twice. Then the judge asked counsel to approach, obviously, the bench because whatever's going on, and they stayed there for a while. So she said the four things. Ever since Eve, women get blamed uh, for the actions of men. Number two, there are only four accusers. Number three, their memories are corrupted. Uh, number four, they're only looking for money. Number five, there is no evidence against Ghislaine Maxwell. And then she said, quote, what they say and the evidence you see will not support these charges beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a direct quote. Then slightly she said something about Ghislaine, Ghislaine Maxwell is a very, you know, a wonderful person, quote, a graduate of Oxford. Her privileged background and status shouldn't factor in when considering the evidence. So she paints her out to be like the super, you know, person who's done everything right in life and that we shouldn't blame her for doing that. Who, who would do that? Like this, that's not what's on trial here, right? Nobody's accusing her of not having been a good student or a good daughter or a good whatever. It's, it's her actions when she was in uh, Epstein's home when she was assisting when supposedly these women say she knew she groomed them and she brought them to Epstein specifically to have sex because according to well the prosecution Jeffrey Epstein had this like um had to have this right and so Ghislaine Maxwell the only way that she could after her father and his whole company he died and the company fell and everything else Ghislaine Maxwell didn't have any money not money like she had when her dad was alive and so it, by all reports you can read it you can see it there's documentaries like crazy saying that Ghislaine Maxwell came to New York City she had so many connections but she had no money and Jeffrey Epstein had money but not the connections that she had so it was a perfect match so 
the prosecution makes the argument that in order for uh, Ghislaine Maxwell to continue to live the life that she was accustomed to living, she had to provide him with this service until they figured out a way to get the girls themselves to start bringing in more girls. What they would do allegedly is to pay these girls like, hey, if you have friends, I'll pay you 300 bucks or a couple hundred bucks. You're a teenager. You may not see anything wrong with that. And, and that's how it eventually became, and they called it a, a sex trafficking pyramid scheme, which, I mean, I wasn't there, but all the documentaries and everything I've seen, like, I don't know. So then going back to the defense. Now, this is what made us all go like, I'm sorry, what? So now she starts talking about Jeffrey Epstein, and at length, okay, this wasn't like a small thing. She was really going for it. Um, quote, there's a direct quote. He was a bright, fascinating man. Direct quote, uh, charisma and charm. Um, he charmed Ghislaine. She was his employee. She made a very hard, you know, uh, distinction there. She was his employee, a time consuming task. So in other words, her, she was only an employee. She wasn't a best friend. She, even though he called her that, um, she wasn't the lady of the house, even though all the staff considered her to be. She wasn't, even though she was the one doing everything, supposedly she was just an employee and it was a time time consuming task. So I assume she didn't say it outright, but is that meant to say that it's too time consuming to actually have um, committed the crimes that are alleged against her? Because if Epstein was also busy and he was able to do it, then, right? But whatever, she didn't say that directly. It just was like inferred by me. Uh, so as she was talking, Ghislaine looked blankly off, right? And then she said, I, this like, I don't understand where the defense is going with this because I don't, I don't know who thought this was a great idea. She said, this is a direct quote. Private planes are like a Hampton, Hampton Jitney in the air. What she meant to say, I think, was like, don't blame or don't look at these people differently because they're flying around in private jets and having like billionaires on there. You know, it's just like a Hampton Jitney, but it's in the air. That's all it is. So it's not a big deal, which was super. Con I mean, the whole thing was super confusing. Uh, then she said. Referring to Ghislaine Maxwell, she, oh, again, an employee. She was not his best friend. She didn't say that, but she just kept hammering it in. She was just an employee. Okay, so now the defense says, well, there's four different stories decades and decades ago. That's a direct quote. They can't pinpoint the dates of what they're alleging. Uh, stories that only came out after Epstein died. Quote, and there's nobody else to point the finger at. So they're just going after Glenn because Epstein's dead and that's it. And then she said, memory and money is driving the accusers purely from memory. Memory changes. Um, un it's untr this is a direct quote, untrustworthy, un uncorroborated, unreliable. Okay. So she called it an introspective interpretation. And she's asking the jury to ask themselves if the, if the accusers are, quote, reliable, credible, and plausible, right? So, I mean, that that makes sense. I mean, that would have made sense. It would have made more sense if she had not said all these like wonderful things about Jeffrey Epstein and called him like, oh, this was the next thing. So then she said, there's no, quote, direct quote, there were no eyewitnesses to any of the allegations, no documentation. And then she called Epstein, now she's going at him again. Like he was like this and he was like that. He was a quote, quote, 21st century James Bond. Like our room, we were just couldn't believe it. Like how could you, how can your defense be trying to make Epstein the person that you are being associated with into anything else but what he was, right? So then she said, um, she talked a lot about his habits, about his demeanor, how he was, uh, you know, so charismatic and, and how he was such a, um, 
he really wanted to help out young people and he was such a, a patron and he was constantly helping people in the arts, helping people get started in their careers or get their education. And like, she's just putting him on this pedestal and we're just like not believing any of it, right? So, okay. So now she says, quote, the government is looking in a rear view mirror. Quote, lawful conduct that has been labeled as grooming. Okay, so she says that Ghislaine asking these girls or going shopping with these girls and all this is legal conduct and it can't be considered grooming. But that has to be put into context. If that shopping or whatever girls days that they would have led to something else, then obviously it is grooming. I mean, that's right. Because if you look at any, any, trial that has to do with pedophiles or whatever they always look at that right you can't just it's not just the act in and of itself it's when did it start because it takes time to groom a kid to groom their parents into like trusting you and whatever else this all takes time this is a this is a direct like modus operandi this is how they work so the defense was trying to separate whatever action happened before the allegations with the allegations, like separate it completely so that, that has, that's not grooming, that's something natural and it's legal, right? It's lawful. So again, she kept saying the government, the government, the government. Then she said something interesting. She said, each of the witnesses have gotten money from the Epstein fund from the same, and now the Epstein fund is administered by the same people who distributed the 9-11 funds but unlike the 9-11 uh, event, this case has no proof. I didn't know that. I didn't know that these funds were uh, administered by the same organization. I had no idea about that. Then she said, then she started breaking down the accusers, right? So she goes after Jane. Uh, she was a talented musician and blah, 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 blah. And she said, okay, because Epstein is a patron of the arts and he's a sponsor of young talent. Sponsor of young talent is a direct quote. Um, and so is patron of the arts. So Jane, the alleged Jane, whoever that is, lived in New York City in an apartment paid by Epstein with her mother and her brothers. He paid for everything while she attended a prestigious school. All the accusers received Epstein's sponsorship and benefited from his largesse. The defense made her opening statement all about Jeffrey, yep, and was more of an attorney for him than for Ghislaine Maxwell. That's absolutely true. And, and that's it. So basically what she did, like, went by the time I left, so that's the gist of it, right? The defense is saying these accusers got so much money. They got $5 million uh, up front from the fund, and now they want more. Now that Jeffrey Epstein is dead, a lot of these women that before were never saying a word now have come forward and now they want more money or they want some money. The way that it sounded was as if she was going after the accusers for being gold diggers and for having enjoyed um, a lot of privileges because of Epstein. And, and she never once, the defense attorney never once said that that came at a price. She made it sound... It was weird because it's like you're defending Ghislaine Maxwell, but all you're talking about is Jeffrey Epstein and trying to build him up into this person who was maybe misunderstood or maybe, you know, the press got it wrong or maybe these accusers are just full of it and none of this ever happened. That is the impression that we all got. And we were all pretty much floored because if there's one thing that we know is that whether or not he passed before he was able to be completely like, you know, just tried and, and have a full trial and whatever, like there's so much against this man and there's so many weird um, associations that he had and so many strange uh, events that took place. This didn't come from nothing. If back in 2009, he was, he made a plea deal and, and he pled, and then like the government made a sweetheart deal with him without telling the accusers anything. They didn't, they didn't know a thing. And they went ahead and made this deal with him. That's, that's reason enough to doubt that this man is innocent, that he's just some like wonderful patron of the arts and he's just here to take care of young girls and help them and their families. Like, are you kidding me? This already happened in 2009. If he was so innocent, he would have never pled. 
If he was so innocent, none of that would, it would have just gone away, but it didn't. And it came back up. So how can you, how, how can the defense attorney take this stance? And if this is the stance that, that the defense is going to take moving forward, I mean, we'll see because I'll be there tomorrow. Um, if this is the stance that the defense is going to take, then basically the jury will be asked to make a moral decision. Like who do they believe more? Girls or women that claim that when they were girls, um, they were abused by Ghislaine Maxwell or a defense attorney that's actually saying wonderful things about Jeffrey Epstein. That is the corner that the defense has put herself in today with today's opening statements. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I'm sure that when the women take the stand, the accusers take the stand, there's going to be some major back and forth and it's going to be interesting to see this. And once again, I got home, turned on the TV just in case like somebody was reporting it or, you know, went online. It just, there was really nothing that I, I there was a lot more that could have been said that wasn't said, obviously, right? But even like, I, I turned on CNN, nothing. Fox, it just so happened that Fox was talking about this trial and then Geraldo Rivera was like, oh, you know, this is horrific. She should have had bail. You know, Ghislaine Max was being held and this is not, you know, it's not right and, and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, that's, and that's it. It was like a two minute conversation that they had on the five, I think. And that was it. So I will be there and I will cover it and I will give you guys the information and I will tell you and write the notes. And I'm sorry that this is what I had, but I didn't bring a notebook. They took away our phones as soon as we walked in. They took away anything that could, even my my watch, which tomorrow I'm just gonna wear like a regular watch because no recording devices whatsoever. So I am going to take better notes and I will get back to you guys tomorrow with more. And I will tell you direct quotes again and also how it felt and also how the room reacted to what was going on so that we can figure this out together. I do think it's very important. Um, you know, I don't know if if Ghislaine sees herself in a position where she is going to go down, she may talk. I don't know, right? And if she does, I don't think I've heard anyone talk about like the economic implications of that because if she does, if it comes to that and she starts naming names and any of those names are CEOs of any top corporations, the market is going to have a day, like a really hard day. I think most shareholders would want to separate themselves from the scandal. If she does start talking, they're going to pull their money out and the markets are going to go nuts. So just be, see, just be aware of that. Um, I guess we'll see the, the, the trial is scheduled for the next six weeks. Anything can happen from here to then, but of course I will report back to you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Leave all comments below. If you have not subscribed to my channel yet, please do so. Please turn on the notifications and please, this is annoying, but many subscribers have told me that they've been unsubscribed many times, three times even. And so you will unfortunately have to check up and make sure that you're still subscribed. If you're still interested in getting the content, turn on the notifications so that you get a little alarm. As soon as you know, the next one comes up, I will be doing this every day until God knows until God says, or until the trial's over or until whatever happens happens. So I love you guys. Thank you so much and see you tomorrow.